The Holy Gospel today is according to St. John, the ninth chapter, and since it's another long reading, I'll invite you to be seated. Now, as Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is not this man the one who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, it is he. Others were saying, no, but it is someone who looks like him. But he kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, a man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He says, I don't know. They brought, to, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he received his sight. He said to them, he put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, he is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked him, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But we do not know how it is that he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said that because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders, for the Jewish leaders had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I don't know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know is that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to be his disciples? Then they reviled him saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we don't know where he comes from. The man answered, here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to the one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could, not, he, could, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born entirely in sins and you are trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out. And when Jesus found him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? 
He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And the blind man, or the man formerly blind, worshiped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say we see, your sins remain. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Okay, so I want you now to all close your eyes for a little bit. Keep them closed for a little bit. Now imagine if this is all that you saw since birth. Nothing. An absence of light and images. No visual cues to help you move around or get around. No colors, nothing. Now imagine living 2,000 years ago, a time where there would have been no public or private services to even help those with visual impairments work at a job, get around, or make a living. Those who were blind or had other ailments or disabilities had little options open to them in those days begging and hoping for some compassion from those around them, feeling hopeless, singled out by society and the church or the temple community, that was their norm. Keeping your eyes closed, imagine not being able to see since birth and being told that your blindness was caused by some sinful action on the part of either your parents or yourself. Blindness and illnesses were believed to have been caused by some sinful action by you or a relative. And because of your sin, the the closest that you could get to the temple church was to stand outside the door and beg for money or food as the, quote, healthy people entered, because you were not welcome there. And since you were not welcome in the temple, there was no chance that you could begin to have a relationship with God. Your blindness... Your illness, your disability was believed to be a punishment by God for your sins. Keeping your eyes closed for just a minute longer, now imagine a man named Jesus coming up to you and saying that you were born blind in order that God's glory could be revealed. In other words, you were born blind because God wants to prove something through you. You can open your eyes now. I've got a real problem with Jesus and God in today's story. What Jesus says makes me a little angry and hurt because it suggests that God made this man blind from birth so that 18 to 20 years later, the glory of God could be shown through Jesus spitting on the ground and rubbing mud on this man's eye. It's as if Jesus perpetuates the belief at the time that God will cause bad things to happen in our lives. That your illness or your disease or your disability was given to you by God for some higher purpose. And I've got a real problem with that. Because even today, many people still believe that illnesses or disabilities or mental health issues, poverty and the like are all the results of sin and thus a punishment from God. But as I read over this story again and again, I don't think that's really what Jesus meant. I don't think that Jesus meant that God caused this man to be blind from birth. What I think and hope that Jesus is saying here is that this man who was born blind from birth, that God will use this man to show God's glory. This way of thinking about Jesus' comment has an entirely different feel because I believe that God can work in and through people with illnesses and disabilities all for God's glory. But I've got another problem with this story. 
And that's that Jesus spits on the dirt, creates mud, rubs it on the eyes of this man, and now he can see. Now, don't get me wrong. My problem is not with the miraculous healing or the powerful works that Jesus can do, because I believe that the miracles and miraculous things do indeed happen. But my problem is that if Jesus could heal this man who was born blind, why has Jesus not healed everybody else? My problems and my questions and concerns about this story and other healing stories are not about what Jesus has done or can do. My problems are in the why. As a pastor, I've had to struggle with this question and this problem more times than I can count. Visiting the sick and the dying in their homes or in their hospital beds and trying to answer the questions of them and their loved ones as to why did their loved one die from a certain disease while the person next door survived? Was there something wrong with their loved one's faith? Did they not believe enough, pray the right way? And I've heard many sick people ask, is God punishing me with this illness? This particular text and story can lead many to the wrong understanding of God and illness and sin. Even the disciples of Jesus ask, whose fault was it that this man was born blind? But then Jesus comes to our help. He answers this question saying that neither the sin of the parent or the person causes someone to be ill. It's also important to understand what John, the, the gospel writer of today's texts, means when he talks about sin throughout his gospel. Because for John, the author of this gospel, sin is not necessarily some moral failure on the part of a person some misdeed or breaking of the law. No, for John, the gospel author, he is writing to the Christian community, the new Christian community. And so the idea of sin for John is centered not on something that we did wrong. It's centered on a broken or non-existent relationship with God. That's what sin is for John, a broken or non-existent relationship with God. This man born blind, though, is seen by the leaders of the church and the temple as a sinner in the moral failure sense of the word. Because as I said before, illness and disability were attributed to moral failings, to wrongdoings, to not following the laws. So this man's supposed sin was the reason for the temple leaders to keep him from entering into the temple and from worshiping God and from being in community with others and from getting the help and the support that this man so desperately needed his whole life. So it's no wonder that this man, up until meeting Jesus, does not have a relationship with God. He's been kept away his whole life. But then Jesus enters the story. It is Jesus who sees this man born blind and enters into his life, unannounced and yes, even uninvited. This man born blind does not call out to Jesus for help like what happens in so many other healing stories. Instead, this healing story has a little bit of a twist. It is Jesus who finds this man and initiates a relationship with him. This blind man has no reason to listen to Jesus or to follow Jesus' instructions, but he does so anyways. He does exactly what Jesus tells him to do. And he comes back able to see. And it happens on the Sabbath day, a day in which you're not supposed to do any type of work, including healing. First, this man hears the word of God in Jesus. Then this man sees God in the person of Jesus. And yes, this man even feels the word of God as Jesus rubs mud on this man's eyes. And now that this man can see, it can be argued that his state of supposed sin in the moral wrongdoing sense of the word is no longer there. He's been healed. His sins are now forgiven. 
which poses a problem for the temple leaders, those Pharisees. Do they now let this man back into the temple or into the temple for the first time, this former sinner who was blind, or do they still keep him out? From John's gospel point of view about sin, this man now has a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. The idea of sin being a broken or non-existent relationship with God has now been wiped away, washed away in the waters. No matter how we look at it, this man's sins have all been forgiven. The question now for these Pharisees is deeper than just admitting this man into the temple. This healing story forces them or to ask important questions. Is illness created by human sin? Is illness God's punishment? Or is someone's illness just simply a reason to keep them out and away? Because if illness or a disability is not the result of sin or is not punishment from God, then all people, regardless of their state of health, should be allowed in to worship and praise God in the temple and to build a relationship with God. If illness or disability is not the result of sin or punishment, then people with illnesses and disabilities should not be shunned or seen as second-class citizens. And if sin, according to John's gospel, is a broken or non-existent relationship with God, then we need to invite all people into the church so that they can have a relationship with God and find that healing that they seek. The reality is, is that we are all broken and sinful people when it comes to our relationship with God. All of us, myself included, fail to put God first in our lives. We often think we know what is better. In many ways, we are all blind when it comes to fully seeing God and God's work in this world and in one another. We are all deaf when it comes to hearing God's call to love God, to love one another, and even to love ourselves as we are. And we are all disabled when it comes to living out our faith in the world. And yet this morning, here we are, in person and virtually, still in the midst of this pandemic. We have come to see and to hear and to feel God's love and healing power in our lives. We have come to be renewed and refreshed in our relationship with the triune God. We have come to find hope and grace and forgiveness in our lives. Now, later on today, many of us will be in some way or another helping to feed people within our community, healing and feeding those who are hungry, showing God's work of love through our actions, living out our faith in the world so that others can see the goodness of God and come to a relationship with God. Now, at the end of the story, the man who was born blind was eventually and unfortunately kicked out of the temple permanently. But when Jesus heard this, he went to find this man, and this man came to believe in Jesus and worshiped him. This man born blind now sees who Jesus is. This man sees that Jesus is God made flesh. This man who was once seen as a sinner in the eyes of the leaders of a temple is now a disciple of Christ and in a relationship with the very God who made him and now healed him. But we still need to wrestle with the original problem that I mentioned in this story. Why was this man miraculously healed, and yet so many of us who have illnesses or disabilities don't find that same type of miraculous healing? As you all know, I've been diagnosed with a progressive neurological disease called Parkinson's. It has no cure at this time, and the reality is there probably will be no cure found in my lifetime. It will progressively get worse. So I would love nothing more than for Jesus to come in and spit on the ground, rub dirt all over my head, and have my disability disappear. But what I've come to recognize is that healing an illness or a disability is more than some magical cure 
that makes it all go away like saliva and mud. And I'm pretty sure that each and every one of us either has some illness or knows of someone with an illness that we so desperately want to be cured of and to be rid of. Today's story, and this pun is intended, can open our eyes to see the many ways that God is healing us who have illnesses or disabilities and is healing our loved ones. How, you may ask? Through medications that reduce or limit the effects of those illnesses. Just think how far we've come with chemotherapy treatments for cancer, medicines that allow people with HIV and AIDS to live very, very long lives, vaccines that have almost eradicated diseases like polio and chickenpox, surgeries that can replace worn out knees and shoulders, hearts, lungs, and kidneys. And God works through you and me to bring healing to those who are sick by simply being present in their lives so that they know they are not alone, not kicked out of the temple or the church, that someone, a community like us, still cares for them and loves them just as they are. Now, I know of those times when our illnesses or disabilities or not knowing what the heck is going on with our bodies can shut our eyes in fear terrified of the unknown, of the undiagnosed. We may become blind, and yes, it becomes difficult to see or feel God's presence in that moment, which is why we need faith, why we need God, why we need a little bit more Jesus in our lives, so that when those difficult days do come, we can place our faith and hope in, a, in God, and know that healing will take place and indeed is taking place. From the doctors looking over us, to the neighbors who bring us a meal, to the person who just gives you a hug. From a community that welcomes you as you are, or from that quilt or prayer shawl that keeps you nice and warm and comfy. Like this man who was born blind, Jesus just shows up oftentimes unannounced, to give us words of comfort and forgiveness, love and grace, and yes, indeed, healing. So keep your eyes open now, open to the many and various ways that each of us are healed, and to then to see how we may help to heal others. Amen.